Did you hear the news today that a father had laid on top of this 18-year-old baby and I got a shooting and his wife was killed too? That just makes me sick. Is there some way to take out those wrinkles and to make the hair grow a little thicker and you know those kind of things? There's something that claim they can. Yeah. Just take this little bill and yeah. <laughs> Makeup artist. Hi guys. Okay, glad you guys are here tonight. Evan and tell me your first name. Brittany. Brittany. Okay. Brittany. Okay. Brittany. Okay. Brittany. Okay. I'm going to write that down here. Okay. Hey, you know they're going to be working on the water in Mary tomorrow, so don't bring it at all. I know, I know who you are, and you're connected all that stuff. I just didn't. Good. Okay. Now he's usually got me in jail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Keith, what are you up to tonight? For some reason. I'm not sure why. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll let you pass some of these out. Go ahead and just take a minute. Put them, put them over there and I put them right over here. Just put that here over there. Yeah, yeah, just that. So that might be one. I'll pass you one. You want one? Yeah. No. Okay, you're going to be in here or you're going to be going? I'll be here. Well, here, I got a scripture to show you. Since I left you out last week. <laughs> Yeah. Are we going to have the Lone Ranger? Yeah, we are. Sure. Yeah. You are trying to call your mother to get a phone turned off. What's that? I tried to call your mother out of her phone. Yeah. That's my phone. Yeah. Oh, really? Did you get his advice? Okay. Did he buy anything? Prayer request. Uh, look at your sheet. Um, I can think of one that I want to put on here. Steve Plummer, you guys know Steve's dealing with cancer and stuff right now, so uh, bladder cancer and I think uh, prostate cancer. So, uh, and you know, Steve and Janine, they just love to go to Africa and they love to take trips and man, this has knocked them out of good and doing all the missionary stuff and I'm sure they're very disappointed. So, and, uh, so anyway, remember them. Who else? Go. Um, our dentist in Harrisburg, Mark Flanagan, has Mark. just had a heart attack, and this is his second one. Okay. So I'd like to put him on the prayer list. Mark Flanagan from Harrisburg, who's a dentist, you said. Okay. A second heart attack. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Need to put on the list. I hope he does well. Look on the, on the list there for anybody who needs to, to especially re remember. Uh, I know your brother's doing a lot better. Yeah, right? I was going to mention he was in Barnes Jewish, but he is officially released now yeah. as of Saturday. So as of Saturday. He's back home, and, I mean, he's going to be home for good. Yeah, um, amen. 
something else comes up, but hopefully not. Because that's quite a you know, good story. He's tired of being in the hospital. So. Terrible, <laughs> terrible what he had to go through. But yeah, uh, yeah. He, he, the Sam, him, and Josephine appreciate all the prayers and thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm place where I can't talk. <laughs> Makes me think. I better do that scene. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you anyway. Okay. Even, even Jerry is on. By hearing me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, all right, guys, come on in. Okay. Uh, anybody else we need to remember? Yeah, she passed away, of course. Yeah. Yep. Eva has been a real faithful person for a long time here, and she is one of four girls that ran around together all the time in high school, and one of them was my sister-in-law, who lives out in North Carolina now. And uh, so... Uh, uh, Another one lives out in California, and then another one lives here in Marion. And uh, Sandra. Sandra Barrett, right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, they were real good friends for years, got together for years and stuff. And of course now it's, and she's gone, and it's hard to not going to And it's hard to believe that she was still working. Yeah, I know it. Over at Southside. I know it. And those guys just loved her. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know it. Ronnie, would you remember a prayer in the additions of Ben Steve Plummer and Mark Flanagan, okay? Then friends of I family. Can. Yes, hold on a second. I don't know. How's Charles doing? I'm a real up to date. Uh, I mean, nothing different anyway. Okay. He's home, of course, but fairly weak. And okay. Okay. But I think okay. His, uh, Charles is 90. My daughter in law told me the other day at vacation Bible school that he was able to get around. She said nothing fantastic. Okay, good. Good. Charles is 90 years old and it would be, I know I'm not beyond saying this, he has influenced so many people in this area in so many different ways. And some of us have spent a lot of time with him in Bible studies and stuff. He's just a great guy. Okay, Ronnie, listen some prayer. Lord, we thank you for the Amen. Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. We were going to talk about the young earth tonight, but we're going to put that off one week, okay? And uh, I guarantee you that uh, it will be interesting next week because uh, um, I was working on some of that earlier today, and I'd forgotten how interesting that is. If you've been over to see uh, the museum in Cincinnati or the, the Noah's Ark, uh, well, it won't be quite as shocking, maybe. But if you haven't ever seen some of this stuff, some of the stuff, you're going to find out that uh, your science teachers you had in high school or junior high or grade school, maybe good, bad, or <laughs> good, good intentions, didn't tell you the truth about everything. It's going to be real interesting, I guarantee you, next week to find out the difference. And when we get to looking at some of the, 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 uh, the, the what the Bible has to say, what supposedly science has to say, which uh, 
what uh, the uh, the theory gap theories theories in between to try to put the theories together have to say. We're going to talk about all that stuff next week, and I, I guarantee you'll be interested. But anyway, tonight we're going to I'm going to just talk about something that I felt like last week. The Lord told me to talk about tonight, um, and it's how we respond to God as Christians. Okay, how we how our relationship each is with God. All of us in this room know the most important relationship we ever experience is with the Lord. But for many reasons, that relationship is placed on the back burner in our lives a lot of times. Why is that? Why? Too busy living. Too busy. That's exactly the number one I thought about. Yeah. Uh, what else? Television. Well, yeah. Television, sure. Media. All the stuff that goes along with that. Um, I'll just basically say, in general, things are more important, more pressing, sometimes more exciting or interesting, less demanding it seems like. And so sometimes we put that, that relationship in the back burner. We can't see the immediate reward sometimes or even see the, the Lord even though He's clearly talking to us through His Word, daily devotions, pastoral sermons, weekly Bible studies. But we may often avoid this or listen whole hum through the lessons, through the sermons, whatever, you know, even our Bible study sometimes, because we think we can handle our own life and make our own decisions, so we don't necessarily have to have God there to, take, to do it with us all the time, right? And, but the truth is, we've all made a lot of mistakes. And in this room, a few younger ones, but a lot of us older ones, we know a lot of mistakes, right? You know. And uh, so, the wisest man that ever lived was Solomon. And he, uh, he seemed to lose his wisdom later in life because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But he did write, in the last book he wrote some things. What did he write there, John? He wrote uh, in Ecclesiastes 12. Nine. Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 14. Yeah. In addition to the teacher being a wise man, he constantly taught the people knowledge. He weighed, explored, and arranged many proverbs. The teacher sought to find delightful sayings and write words of truth accurately. The sayings of the wise are like cattle prods, and those from masters of collections are like firmly embedded nails. The sayings are given one by one shepherd. But beyond these, my son, be warned, there is no end to the making of many books. And much study wearies the body. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands, because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Wow. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. We know that. Because God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Now we know... That's not talking about being saved, going to heaven or hell. But it knows all those things, one of these days we're going to stand in front of the Lord for all those things in our life. Whew! <laughs> yeah. I don't want any testimonies here tonight about that stuff. We'll go to have some others, but not that. But whew. In James Dobson's book, Turning Hearts Towards Home, I like to refer to Dr. Dobson. He's my hero in one sense. I got a chance to spend a, a month or so with him back 1989 in the program. And, uh, but anyway, he talks in a book that was written, uh, that was uh, 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 Turning Hearts Towards Home. He said that uh, there was a letter written uh, to him six years after his father had died. Uh, died in 1977. I'm a firefighter from Kansas City, Missouri. He said, in a 15-year career, some incidents stand out by themselves. One such call affected me differently. Your father had collapsed moments before we received the call. I think this particular day may have been a holiday or a Sunday. When the call came in, I drove the apparatus to the scene. When we arrived, there's two other men ran in and started CPR. I put the block down under the wheel and entered the house. It seems like five or six people were in the house. The table was nicely set with silver and china. My captain and firefighter were starting to work on the man who was lying on the floor. My job then was to gather information from my relatives concerning name, age, phone number, medication, whatever. I also have my duty to help give comfort to the person in need. And many times before, as many times before, the lady who identifies herself was the patient's wife was unable to give me much information. She started to ask me about the welfare of her husband and said, usually we tell relatives to try to stabilize the parent that everything's going to be okay, transfer them 
you know, we're guessing that the patient's going to do okay. We try to help people see the bright side of the situation. Your mother asked me if your father was going to be all right. Knowing the background of your parents, I took a chance that's got me in, could have gotten me in a lot of trouble with my superiors. I have never answered like this before or since. But I told her if he knew Jesus, she was okay. Or he was okay. She responded that he was a Nazarene minister. The question was still on her face. So I answered her again and I said, if he knew Jesus, he's okay. She told me he had been an art professor for eight years in Nazarene College. I responded the same as before and again spoke in a way that would cause a person to think he was not Christian, but an important leader in the church. She had been fighting back the tears. I looked her straight in the eyes and softly I said, if he knows Jesus, he is okay. The tears were held back no more. She finally realized that he had probably died. She said, he knows Jesus. He's all right. I think she felt some peace at the time, he said. He was no longer alive in the flesh, but he was with the Lord. We know that happens instantly. He says, I thought you might want to hear this version of what happened the day your father passed on her. In hearing you speak of him, I've rather known him in life instead of having to show up at his, at his death. My own father is not a Christian yet. Please pray for his salvation. Pretty good story, though. The first step in to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We know that. Okay. How many of you were greatly influenced by your parents to come to know the Lord? Just show of hands. Okay. Most, right? Um, how did they impact your life? Was it your father, your mother that made the biggest impression? I want a quick testimony, but not a book. But, you know, okay. Who'd you say? Okay. Your mom? Your mom? Okay. Uh, how did that happen? Well, it was just because she constantly made sure we were in Sunday school and church every Sunday. Okay. She would take my dad's work truck or whatever and take us. So she drugged you, right? She drugged you to church every time the doors were open, right? Say, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. She was very involved, even though she worked. Okay. Good, good one. See? They were playing the nail scarred hand. It was during a Bible service and my father's hands were on the pew behind me. I looked at his hands and I can imagine a father's heavenly father's love because of the love of my father. Amen. Amen. That's going to tie in a little bit of what we're talking about. Wow. Um, good, both of you, Cheryl. Any good stories? Uh, you know, uh, what, a lot of times we see God as a heavenly father and our father, you know, the Lord's Prayer, Father which art in heaven, how be thy name, you know, the, some of our first ways we see God is, is through, through our father. If we had a loving father, it's easy to see God that way, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Change it just slightly. There was a set of twins, eight years old this morning on the news, and they saved their dad's life out of the swimming pool. They brought him up from the bottom. Is that right? And they made a comment that they knew Jesus was behind them, and when they got him out and the, the EMTs got there to finish reviving him and everything because they were working on him when they yeah. arrived, they said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Great story. Just, they were eight years old? Huh? They're eight years old, you see? Wow. Wow. Well, again, if you have a loving father, it's easy to see God that way. If you had an abusive father, sometimes it's easy to see God that way. If you had a distant father, you know, seldom there, it's easy to see God that way, too. You know, uh, did anybody... Well, I, I, a quick testimony. Did anybody see God... From a not so loving example, don't have to do that if we don't. I, well, there are people. A lot of times that people come from families not that way. We're going to talk about some of those in a minute. If it wasn't your father or mother that made the biggest impact in this area, who else did? How about a spouse? They make a big impre impression. Carl, you shake your head. I know you've told that story many times. Yeah, he has too. He bragged on you. Do what? I had a great-grandmother. Great-grandmother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Grandparents, we tend to, we don't want to forget as grandparents we play an important role in, uh, in, uh, in parents' lives. I know these two right here in front do. and They got a bunch. And, and I know others in there too do. Um, are there any specific events that you recall that impacted your relationship with God that maybe you figured out later in life? Now I'm going to give you an example. Uh, 
my mom had two miscarriages. I would have brothers two years older than me and twins five years younger than me. And uh, I'm sure that had a significant, would have had a significant impact on my life. In fact, we have a niece, my wife's side has a niece, that uh, has four boys. The oldest one's like three years older than the, than the next one, and the next one is like, and then he's like five or six years older than twins that they got, you know. And, and, uh, and that second kid is really kind of weird, <laughs> you know, really strange. Uh, and that's where I'd have been in this. So I can deduce a little bit that, that I probably got more attention and, uh, than I should have, more, you know, from my mother anyway. My dad had a little more sense. More, and, uh, and, you know, I, I've kind of tried to understand why I was always in trouble as a kid. <laughs> you know, always sitting out in the hall, sitting in the back of the room, or I was never the teacher's favorite unless they set me up there at the front, you know, <laughs> for the wrong reasons. <laughs> And uh, always in trouble. I couldn't figure out why, you know, a lot of times when I was a kid growing up, why that was the case. But I, always, I guess because I always had an opinion whether they wanted to hear it or not, right? And, uh, but, you know, when you're, when you're the only kid and, you know, you brought up that way, well, sometimes that's what happens. You know, you, you think you can, you, you know, you're important. You gotta, you're, you're important. You're not important, but you think you are. I mean, you think your, your uh, opinion matters. It doesn't really. <laughs> but anyway. What about you guys? Anything like that that impacted your life that you thought about later on in life that really affected you? Do you know you're shaking your head? Yeah. You rest of I bet there is. If you stop and think about it, some things happen to you in your life. You just, sometimes it's, you, you don't know. Well, anyway, uh, uh, there, uh, I want to uh, ask you guys, sometimes, you know, uh, Sometimes it, we, it felt like with God that I could get away with things. Did it feel that way? And I hate to, to sit back and think about it, but I think that's why, because I could get away with my mom. Now, I couldn't with my dad so much, but I could have then. Mom, uh, what about you guys? Can you, you know, did you, well, it may have been that, maybe something else. I'm going to get into this a little bit more, and maybe I need to explain a little better. But I want to talk about some areas that affect our relationship with the Lord. First, the kind of family that you grew up in. Second, your rank or your, your position in that family. And third, your own personality type. Now, psychobabble, my wife calls this. <laughs> but still, I think it is appropriate to consider when we consider how we relate to our Father in heaven. And I'm going to look at family personality. I'm going to list seven types of family personalities. And you can see which one maybe you come from. The first one is a bonding family. That's kind of the healthy family. Family, it's a healthy balance between individuality and relationships. The kids in this family are encouraged to have the capacity to relate to others because they have a strong sense of identity and security. Okay? Family encourages each other to be all they can be, and they're not threatened by differentness. Now think back when you graduated from high school. Did you have a plan of what you wanted to be in the job world? Some people do. I had one, but it wasn't a very good one. I wanted to be a writer for St. Louis Post so I could cover the St. Louis Cardinals every night. <laughs> Little, uh, we, uh, I got into journalism. I was over there at SIU and I realized pretty quick that uh, there were some students that were faster typers than I was. Some of them were better interviewers than I was. Probably some of them were faster thinkers than I was too. <laughs> However, I did have, I will say this there, when I was in high school, I had a friend, we used to write for the Marion Daily Republican, write sports together, and also I was a, his, I was a sports editor, and he was younger than me, so he was a writer for me in the high school newspaper. But he had more uh, senior time at the city paper than I did. Well, anyway, he graduated high school, and he went down to New Orleans, got involved in, uh, uh, and went to in journalism, got a degree in journalism, got out of journalism, and started writing some uh, script for uh, the New Orleans Jazz, just to be able to get in with them some way. And he did enough that they let him come in there and he wrote some stuff. Pretty soon he was writing for some of the announcers. And then pretty soon they put him on. He was the uh, color man, play-by-play -play and the color man for the New Orleans Jazz. And then he became the play-by-play -play man. Then the New Orleans Jazz moved to Utah. And he hired a coach from Southern Illinois who was the longest coach of any professional sport, by the way, when he coached and finally retired some years ago, Jerry Sloan. 
And uh, Jerry Sloan, being from McLeansboro, he brought Scoop down into the on the bench and become assistant coach with Utah Jazz. <laughs> and then he went on. He was uh, assistant general manager with Denver Rockets, and they had a guy that was a goof off that was general manager, had been a pro basketball player. So he lost, they lost a job, but Utah immediately picked him up as head of all minor league operations. And uh, then and today he still I think does a little bit of stuff with the with the the, the Jazz with the yeah with the Utah Jazz. But uh, this guy this guy kind of made some of those things work for him, you know. But some of us most of us didn't have a good and some people did. Some people wanted to be teachers. Some people wanted to be lawyers, doctors, whatever. Had an idea of what they wanted to do. But some of us didn't have a very good idea, right? And so we kind of wandered around. Uh, but you know, if you come from a real good, strong family, uh, a lot of times you might have had good plans when you graduated. Okay. Okay. The second family is the ruling family. This family has a tendency to be abrasive or insensitive in their relationships. The parent or parents push their authority. Often kids don't feel that much cared for, but they do know how to perform tasks. The kids may be very strong in what they do unless they're very angry at the parents. These kids as young adults may not feel the need that they need the Lord or any authority telling them what to do. They may rebel against it. The third family is a protected family. This children, this family feel cared for, but often the parents do too much for them. Sometimes a child is not allowed to develop a sense of personal confidence. Often the parents do not make him endure the consequences of his or her behavior. These kids as young adults may feel that they certainly need God to help them, but they feel they can get away with any kind of behavior and it won't be that many consequences. The fourth is the chaotic family. This family is disengaged with each other. Their knowledge and their interest in one another is limited. They're more like roommates than a family. Each individual looks out for number one. Caring for others is considered absurd and stupid. These kids as young adults often have a hard time believing that God cares or even exists. And if he is, he's very distant. Okay? Agnostic. You know, we, we, some people are atheists and some people are agnostic. You know what agnostic means? God may be up there, but if he really is, he's not involved in me and any little things. That kind of idea. Okay, the fifth family is a symbiotic family. These individuals in this family find it almost impossible to be self-directed because their individuality is seen as a lack of allegiance to the family. They are weak as individuals, but strong as a group. Children feel smothered in this family, but guilty if they want to leave. Survival comes from conforming to the family and norms or values, like embracing the same political views or eating the same food, joining the same TV shows. These kids as young adults are often afraid of God and don't establish a relationship with Him because they're too tied up with their parents and sometimes very unhealthy relationships. They have trouble thinking for themselves. Next story, i got to tell a story. My favorite story is there's a mom who was very dominant, but uh, eventually... She had three boys, and all three of these boys got out of, out of college and moved on, got, and went into counseling and got help. And they kind of got away from, you know, this dominant mother. But they always did try to please her. Seventy birthday come around, and the oldest one went out and bought a brand new house for his mother. Brand new house, big house. The second one, not to be outdone, went out and bought a Mercedes for his, for his mother with, a, with her own driver, his own, own driver. And the third one, not to be outdone, found a parrot that could quote the whole Bible. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, anything they needed, that parrot could quote it. So the, uh, the, so the, the mother, who clearly gave her opinion, she, they, when this, they got together, she, the first son says, I don't need that house. That's way too big for me. I get lost in there, don't need that anyway. I'm going to sell it. She says the second one, that Mercedes, well, you know, that's a good idea at first, but in truth is, I don't need to be going every place. I says, I finally go someplace, I call my friends, I don't like that driver, it's kind of rude anyway. But the third, she says, you know, I'm glad I got one, one son that's sensitive to my needs. She turned to him and said, the chicken was delicious. <laughs> I thought you guys probably heard that before, but I could have. Yeah. Don't you think the the average person doesn't think of God very often? But when you get up in the morning, or, or when I was coming here, the trees were still green. Yeah. They've been green for a long time. Yep. Grass is still green. Amen. And I made it to church. 
I was just thinking about that. It's just on the way here. Yeah. But it happens all the time. Yep. Yeah. Amen. God is there talking to us. And we're going to listen. Well, you're, you're, we're going to talk a little more of what you're saying. You're exactly right. Of course, if I'm riding down the road in the middle of the road with uh, with your contraption, I'd be thinking of God, too. <laughs> that's all really right, so. Okay. Um, the seventh kind of, the sixth kind of families are traumatic families. These include families or alcoholic families, abusive families, hyper-religious families, disadvantaged families who come from very poor language difficulties or just tough backgrounds. And if you come from one of these type of families, you know the trust is a very different thing, difficult thing. Sometimes God can be very distant or very conditional. With You know, with alcohol, come out of alcohol families, it's don't trust, don't talk, don't feel. And hidden secrets from abuse keep God's way off in the distance. If God really cares and loves me, you know, why didn't he stop this from happening to me? That's what a lot of times I think, okay? And then the last one is divorced families. And divorced families, depending on the age, children divorced usually feel a lot of guilt from divorce. They have trouble navigating their relationship with each parent. So they have young adults often have trouble trusting God and relating to Him in a healthy manner. You know, I was talking to a guy yesterday, and he was telling me of his family. He said uh, he got a daughter that's divorced. And so he said they got together on 4th of July, and he said it was great because he said they get along great for the kids and everything else. But that's not usually what happens. A lot of times what happens is they... They go different directions. And uh, there's a lot of anger there. Uh, I know early on years when I was doing counseling, uh, there was a, uh, I can't even think what it's called now, uh, a position where you would work in the court system and you work for the judge, basically, and the judge would give the final order, but you basically come up with the, with the recommendation of the judge. So you do counseling with, the, with all these people. And uh, boy, early on I was doing a situation and uh, the, the couple, the, the guy had taken the kids and gone, uh, he's supposed to have them a week. He took them for two weeks and went down over Christmas vacation and was gone a lot longer than was supposed to. And our mom and dad, I mean, they hate each other. I thought they were going to come in with the weapons. I mean, they just couldn't get along. And that's when I finally decided, I don't believe I want to be in this world too much. You know, I could have made a lot of money doing that, got a, and they get extensive training doing that kind of stuff. And today, uh, I forgot what they call that call that other lawyers do that a lot of times today but some social workers get trained in it and do it but it's a tough position because people go through divorce there's a lot of anger lots of anger okay so let's talk about another issue where do you rank in your family you know think about whether you're the oldest the second one the third you know the youngest the twin uh, baby uh, you know just let you be thinking about that as you go through this I had a professor <laughs> one time said this he said he had three boys. And he said the first one, he says we have uh, got every uh, documented day of every successful day of his life, I think, uh, you know, out there. He says the second one was a good, uh, good uh, uh, athlete, so we got a lot of news articles on him. He said the third one, they got a snapshot of him somewhere in the house, but they don't know where it's at. <laughs> now, do you think this might have any bearing how, how one relates to God initially, do you think? I don't know. Think about that. You know, older ones are usually harder workers and achievers. Second ones are usually more relational, but not always. The third ones can be a combination or none of the above or a rebel, total rebel. Sometimes that happens with the second one, but the first and the third are often, cause are often alike. But I had a professor who once told me, he said, when you look at this kind of stuff, you look to see if it fits, great. If it don't, throw it out. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times, um, where you're at in the family makes a difference. And how one relates to the father and sometimes the mom is, is a lot to how they relate to God, right? I okay. was the youngest of six kids only by 15 minutes. No oh, boy. Because my twin brother was right. born 15 minutes before me. Yeah. <laughs> and that made me the baby of the family. Yeah. <laughs> and every time great cards came out, I'd pray for rain because my dad's mom was scared and he'd have to bring her home and he'd always say, don't whip him, he's a baby. <laughs> I love the rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good, yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. Well, now let me just consider one other area. We talk about family personalities. We talk about, you know, uh, where you're, you're, we're in the family. One other to consider is uh, personality types. 
I'm going to give four generals here, real ones here, okay? Sometimes businesses use these kind of things. Caloric, sanguine, melancholy, and phlegmatic. You've probably heard those names before, but I'll explain them. The caloric personality is a strong-willed individual who has to be in charge most of the time. They don't usually sit and let someone else lead. They take the reins, even if others may not want them to. They run businesses, political parties, newspapers, tech companies, sports franchises, anything else they can be in charge of. In the animal kingdom, we call these lions. In the Bible, uh, there's all kinds of examples, but one of them is Paul. You know, before he became a Christian, Saul, he was working hard to be a leader. You know, he wanted to, uh, he's probably working to try to work his way on the Sanhedrin. You know, be a Pharisee, he had all kinds of uh, education and training for some of the top top people in, in the land. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but then he met, met the Lord, the Lord completely, of course he had to get his attention, you know, by knocking him off his mule and, and, uh, uh, and uh, speaking to him in a loud voice when he was blinded for three days. But, you know, the fact is, is that uh, um, uh, he was a strong leader for the Lord. Now, what are the strengths and weaknesses of these kind of people? A dominant personality. What do you think? A lot of them think they know it all. Yeah, right. <laughs> They're going to be boss. Um, strength sometimes. They, they, they don't quit. I mean, they get things done, they get it done. You know, they push no matter what. They don't, you can have all kinds of uh, opposition, they don't quit. But they think they can do it. They don't need a lot of advice, help, or, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and sometimes without God's leadership, they go off on their own and get in trouble, right? Uh, what about this? the sanguine personality is the second one. That's a very likable people person uh, who can party with the best of them. Actually, sometimes they may plan to party and forget to show up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, or is often late, all right? Details, not their strength. These guys make great salesmen. They can sell icebergs to Eskimos and make them feel good about it, but don't expect them to write out the receipts, right? Uh, you know, um, they can step in leadership roles and often do, but they may not be committed to it for very long. They can easily place their foot in the mouth at the wrong time. And I use Peter as an example. Now, he became a strong leader for the Lord. But his years as a disciple under Jesus could put him in this role at this time. You know, uh, uh, you know of course, you know, well, I'll get that later. But anyway, uh, otter is an example. They might use a lot of otters fit together, you know. Sanguine, chloric, they're both extroverted personalities. Now, two more, two, the other two are more introverted. The melancholy is... Um, is more introverted and usually behind the scenes. These are people that are usually highly intelligent, very bright, talented individuals who are artistic, musical, good in architecture, engineering, anything they do, they're thinkers and workers. But they also have to deal with anger sometimes, behind the scenes. They can be controllers. They can be leaders, and one of the greatest leaders of all time in the Bible is Moses. And... Uh, you know, he certainly at first was a reluctant leader, but through God's help, a powerful one. Okay? And the animal we usually use as an example of that is the, uh, uh, the beaver. Hard worker. Okay? Hard work. Okay. And finally, the phlegmatic. These kinds of people make good friends. In fact, best friends. They're very loyal, supportive, great backups in time of trouble. But they are by nature introverted. And young Timothy is a good biblical example of a phlegmatic personality. He was a loyal friend to Paul, but Paul was his mentor also. also, also. These people usually take a back seat, don't have to be up front. In fact, they usually prefer to be more in the crowd than leading. Now, when you look at the strength of each one in their relationship to God, the clerk, strong-willed individual, when problems get in, get in the way, he just finds a way to overcome them. He or she is not afraid of challenges and once under God's leadership can do anything. You know, Paul presented the gospel to all kinds of Jewish leaders of his day and talked in front of all kinds of groups. He actually uh, talked in Athens, which was a high academic thing of the day, you know. Uh, led many to the Lord on his missionary journeys. Wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. I think 13 books in the New Testament he wrote. Uh, and uh, 12 or 13, one of them is Hebrews. We're not sure he wrote that or not, but he may have. But anyway, uh, you know, much of our Christian doctrine comes from him, Okay. But, what kind of weakness does a caloric personality have? Well, if he quits listening to God and thinks he can do it on his own, King David, classic example. David was a man after God's own heart. 
a great man, God. But he, uh, he, uh, you know, he had to fare with Bathsheba. He wasn't listening to God. He decided to do it on his own. What's the strength of the same one? You know, we talked about relating to people, well like and lead when necessary. And Peter took a chance. Remember him? He walked out on the water. Then he got out there and looked around and got afraid. Started sinking, right? Uh, took his mind off Christ and started sinking. What's their weakness? They let emotions control them sometimes. Quickly make decisions without trusting the Lord. Letting fear control. Remember the night Jesus was arrested? Peter denied him three times before the cock crow. Okay? Strength of the melancholy. When he follows the Lord, he can be accurate and precise and not always swayed by God. Or not swayed by others, I mean, sorry. God can lead this man or woman to think outside the box. But what's his weakness? Well, anger can lead him away from God and can be lacking in compassion. Moses was a great man of God. But you recall why he didn't get to go in the promised land? Why? Yeah, the Lord told him, he said, uh, you know, you know, uh, strike the rock, the water come out. People were complaining because they get thirsty and want clean water and all that stuff. And, but he was sick and tired of the people. And you get the feeling he took a, he didn't strike it like ass, he took a Mark McGuire swing, you know. Hit that rock as hard as he could, and water come gushing out. And, uh, but it wasn't just that incident. Anger had been a hidden issue for him and had, and had to deal with it. And you know, <laughs> think about a woman that fits this personality. She had a hammer behind her back as she spoke to the mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Take all the time you need before you phase your response. <laughs> you know, anger, hidden anger, an issue. Okay, what about the phlegmatic? What kind of strengths does he or she have? Very lawyers, friends, workers, neighbors, etc. Will the Lord they listen to respond to certain needs that the families and the church have, even the church needs? And uh, weakness is a fear, and often fear of failure. So while they so while they try anything, they might fail. They're afraid to, afraid to try things that might fail. Under strong leadership, they may uh, uh, they uh, you know they, they can make it, but they need help sometimes. They're aware of criticism, and often that outweighs the good things that might get done. Okay, I know I'm probably bored with that stuff. Let me give you some examples, and let's case examples, and let's think about this. Let's say Bill comes from a strong bonding family. He's the oldest of three boys. He's somewhat of a caloric personality that he likes to lead out. He's successful in business. His parents are still living. They established a strong church bond while he's growing up, and he's still very much involved today. Uh, what does it take for God to relate to him? Or better, how does he often relate to God? What would you think? Do you think he would be a guy that would trust God very much? Okay, well, I'm using him as an example. He's, he, he's the oldest in the family, uh, was uh, successful in business. He came from a strong family, bonded family. Um, I think it would be easy for him to trust God and listen to him, you know, if he does, he, he follows through with the things, devotion and prayer to God, okay? But what would keep him from listening to God? Pride. Pride, yeah, right. Uh, remember Sunday school lesson we just had Sunday I don't know if he was here Sunday or not uh, we studied about King Asa and Asa was a good king I mean he come in uh, you know he was a uh, uh, grandson of um, of uh, uh, Rehoboam get this right in a minute uh, uh, he was uh, Rehoboam had gotten away from God and they allowed uh, uh, his uh, uh, his wife and others to put to uh, um, Play, uh, worship gods in high places. They set up uh, golden calves in both Dan and in Bethel, two places in the kingdom. And uh, and uh, and she was a powerful lady. Uh, Macaw, I think was her name. And he worshipped Asherah and all this stuff. But when he came in, he cleared all that stuff out. He went against the odds and did the right thing. Not because he come from a strong family, of that, but he did the right thing. Ten years into his, his ministry, uh, the Ethiopian army came to attack him. Ethiopian, Ethiopian army had one million people. Plus, they had 300 chariots. It was a powerful army come against him. Now, he had, by that time, about 600,000 fighters, but it was nothing compared to what they'd have in, in numbers. But uh, he prayed to God and asked God what to do because he'd, he'd handled himself in the right way and trusted God. Uh, 
man, uh, they just routed that Ethiopian army, just destroyed them completely. And, uh, you know, this is a great thing. Now, a few years later down the road, probably about 10 or 15 years later down the road, uh, the uh, Israelites were, <coughs> 10 tribes of Israel, were coming against Judah. And they had, what they were doing, there was a city up there called Ramah, which, which they were blocking off the city. What, the, what it amounted to, they were blocking trade routes and all the kind of things that, the, the, that Judah could go through and, and uh, you know, work out its deals with other countries and everything else. And it became a problem. So, this man that's been a good man, been a good leader, strong and everything else, works out a deal with Benadad, who is the Syrian leader, and what he does, he looks up this deal, and he says, we're going to give you gold and silver and stuff if you'll come up against Israel and, and, and make them, and be, really put a stop to them uh, harassing us. And they did. Now the question came up, did the ends justify the means? Well, here's the problem. That time he didn't go to God for help. He handled it by himself. It worked out. But it wasn't what God wanted, because God wanted him to talk to him about it. His pride got in the way, you know, the same thing. And what happened was, God sent a, a prophet to talk to him, a guy, Hanini, I think was his name. And he sent this prophet, and what he did, he got angry when the prophet came and told him what he did. He put the prophet in stocks, basically. And he, and so, and he said he abused some others that tried to talk to him about this. So anyway, he went on, he got sick with a foot problem. And he didn't go to the Lord with that, and it killed him. He died from it. Okay? So a little bit of this pride got away. Now, still, he was a good king. Most of the time, he was a good king, and he did what was right. But that was not some of the things that... Sometimes that pride can get in the way. What if you came out of a chaotic or a divorced family, and you're the baby in the family, and your personality is melancholy? Remember the melancholy, the more... Uh, the, uh, uh, the person that's a perfectionist, really, they do so well in a lot of things, but anger is an issue. We used uh, Moses' example. Uh, the strengths and weaknesses, listening to the Lord. You know, you come from a chaotic or divorced family. Do you think they would listen to the Lord first? They should, but we say, you don't think they would? Why? Uh, they had to fend for themselves for so long, they just, they internalize everything. Good point. Good point. That's exactly right. What did you say? Are you a counselor or somebody? That's <laughs> Uh, what did she, say? she said they had to fend for themselves so long that they felt like it had their own. They didn't want to trust God in it. But of course, what happens when you fend for yourself so long? You get into trouble somewhere down the road. But you're right. You're right. That's part. You know. Uh, um, you know, and, they, and and so a lot of times, you know, they know God can. Sometimes they know God can do anything, but they expect Him to do it for them every time. Shouldn't get sick. Shouldn't have problems. This shouldn't happen to me. I'm just going to do it myself. It's easy to blame God, too. That's another point that might come out of this. What if you grew up in a symbiotic family, a sick, controlling mother, you know, you're the second child, but strangely, a nice person, phlegmatic personality. What's the strengths and, uh, and, and weakness of this kind of person? Remember, they're a very loyal, good friend, but the weakness is sometimes they're afraid of authority figures and... Uh, you know, they don't even give it much help. Fear is an overriding factor, okay? A lot of times, uh, guilt's another. God's just waiting for this person to mess up. That's what they think. He's going to get me when I do mess up, even a little. So where does the confidence come in, but not the wrongful kind of pride? How do we have a healthy relationship with God, the God of the universe who created everything? You know, how can we have fun but be serious about His gospel message? And serious about sin. How can we love people that are sinners, but at times hate to sin, but still love them without giving in to them? You know, there's a lot of questions there that gets in the way of our relationship with God. And I'm not talking about family stuff. I mean, you know, some the thing I've been talking about, some things or other things get in the way. We mentioned a while ago, busy schedule. Focusing on money, fun things, those kind of things. Uh, work, health, general problems in life. There are many things that get in the way of our relationship with God just normally. Despite the family personalities, 
despite our own personalities, despite where we came from and the rank in the family. Okay. Ezekiel 14, 12 to 14. Who's got that? Okay, Keith. He thought I forgot about you, didn't he? <laughs> the Lord came to me, Son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, and I stretch out my hand against it, and break its supply of bread, and send famine upon it, and cut off from it man and beast, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. Okay, God's talking to Ezekiel, and he's disgusted with Judah's unfaithfulness. He said, bad things are going to happen even if these three men were to pray for you. Now, he held these three men in pretty high importance. What makes Noah, Job, and Daniel special? Was they the three that was the righteous, most righteous men in the Bible? I think righteousness is a very important part of that. You're right. What do we know about Noah? The Lord. <laughs> yeah, but he was the only righteous man in his time, wasn't he? In his kids. What do we know about Job? Yeah, he had patience, but he went through terrible things, right? But he still trusted God, didn't he? What do we know about Daniel? Who was alive at the time, by the way, that Ezekiel did? Daniel was taken in captivity around, uh, oh, about seven or eight years, nine years something before Ezekiel was, okay? Uh, was it 605 B.C., something like that? He was taken in, when the first, first round Judah was, was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And then I think the next round was when Ezekiel was taken into captivity. But, uh, so, but Ezekiel was getting this message, because we realized what we talked about last week, that God knows everything past, present, and future. So he knew what Daniel was going to be, even before some of the things Daniel hadn't happened. Like he hadn't been in the lion's den yet. None of that stuff had happened yet. But what do we know about Daniel? Again, very righteous person, very full of wisdom. You know, people trusted him. God, the, the leaders trusted him from other country. I trusted him. Okay? Great man. So, but righteousness is a constant thing. But there's one other thing that I think is important in this. I think it ties in what we're talking about today. They had a constant communication with the Lord. I think their choices to do the right thing came about more with their constant communication with the Lord. They were constantly talking to Him or praying for Him or doing the right thing. When we constantly ask God what to do, does He tell us? Does He? Sometimes. Sometimes you think. Okay. In his time, okay, not sometimes always. But I would say for the most part he does. How, uh, so that constant communication is important and really designed to do the right, have the right relationship with God, right? Okay, how do we do that? How do we put Lord first and find time to constantly communicate with him? Make a decision. Okay, got to make a choice to do that, don't you? Okay, right. Okay, that's the first thing. You're right. What else? How do and we come? His, being in His Word and listening to God through His Word. That's exactly right, Lee. And when's the best time usually to, to study His Word? Probably first thing in the morning. Cause yeah. When I do it at night, I go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. I always do. I mean, reading. Yeah. 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 But the first thing in the morning is one of the best times to do that because we're alert. We're ready to listen. You know, uh, uh, and I just think that's a good time. And, and it's at the beginning of the day. You know, it's the beginning of the day to get started. So a regular devotion and some kind of prayer time each day is, is, is vitally important. But sometimes we're just too busy. How many of you guys have trouble sleeping at night? That's a crowd to ask this age is this age crowd right <laughs> yeah most of us do most of us do now we don't may not have trouble going to sleep at night immediately we'll go home and i'll watch the ball game when i get home my wife and i say i watch the cardinals and uh probably about an hour an hour and a half into it i'll be well, i don't know it depends on how they're doing <laughs> been getting beat so bad it's been easy to go to sleep early lately but but anyway uh you know uh, uh 
a lot of times I'll go to sleep in my chair, so I don't, I don't have trouble going to sleep. But I'll wake up in the middle of the night a lot of times. And I think a lot of us do when we get older. A good friend of mine told me, he said, that is a classic time if you can't go to sleep. And, and one of the things, laying there don't usually make you go to sleep. If you lay there, lay there, lay there, you don't usually go to sleep. It's best to get up, to be honest, and go somewhere and read something, do something. Bet, great time to be able to read your Bible and say, God, what are you talking to me about? What's, what's there tonight? What, what, you know, where are you at with this? And, uh, it, and so he, I think that is a good time to be able to learn. Um, you know, we, we know that he loves us more than anybody else. We listen to preachers and teachers and, and we trust the people that, that's going on in this old world. And we know that just existing in this world is a test. And it's also a trust, isn't it? It's a test. We're all going to have problems. By constant communication, it gives us a chance to work on this righteous life that we're supposed to be dealing with. And I know all of us, you know, I, everybody, I found this case in counseling. Everybody's got something they deal with. If it's not some temptation like alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, money temptations, anxiety, depression, gossiping, whatever, something they're dealing with in their, at, at home or in the community or something. And and that's what keeps us awake sometimes. We don't, sometimes we don't even know it keeps us awake, but it does. But God's constantly dealing with us. And, uh, you know, it's the best thing we have to be able to deal with those issues. Because God wants us to do three things. Respect, listen, respect Him, listen, and obey. The word is fear, but a healthy word for that fear is respect. Respect Him, listen, and obey. What do you guys think? Do you, I mean, I think you probably would agree with that, but what do you think about that? Is it easy to do that, to keep in that constant communication with God? No, no, it's not easy, is it? Is anyone what you're going to say? I think I have ADHD because, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'll be trying, you know, and then, oh, a squirrel, you know. Yeah. Well, again, and I think a lot of times that's why it's probably better in the morning than it is through the sometimes the other day because we do lose our attention. And yeah, that's quick. I quit thinking about other things. My mind goes to other things a lot of times. It sure does. Yeah, Cheryl. But through the day, a lot of times I'll be thinking about some issue or something that I've heard in the news or yeah. something in the family or whatever. Yeah. And I'll start talking to God, and then I'll end up in prayer. Amen. And that's several times during the day. Amen. Days. Amen. 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 Yeah. Sometimes we don't listen. And I think that's because some people are expecting our voice. And that isn't the way God communicates to us anymore. Yeah. And we get it, and we don't get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, the truth is, it's a difficult subject. It's easy to talk about. It's a lot tougher to do. I know that. It is it for me. And there's always a struggle. But the fact is, is that, you know, you look at these three men, great men, and I think they were righteous men, but I think they constantly was in that relationship with God, keeping that communication going. And I think that's what our goal is here on earth, to be that way and be constantly listening to God and talking to Him and looking at things. Because then problems don't become big, big issues. I read, just read this, I don't know what, it was one of the things I was reading that had to do with um, just devotion. And it's about a, uh, uh, a woman, 90 years old, and her husband had been married nearly 70 years, and he died. And they was taking her to a nursing home, and the, and the nursing home director was showing her, taking her to a room, and said, now this is what your room's going to look like. And she says, it's going to be great. And he says, it's great. He says, well, you ain't seen it yet. How do you know it's going to be? He says, I've already decided it's going to be great. I've already had, you know it's going to be great. My decision is based on I'm trusting God that I know it's going to be great, no matter what. And it was. That's how she looked at it. Some of us need to look at our neighbors like that sometimes too, right? You know, other kind of things like that too. But that, having that relationship with God, that constant communication, that's one. Yeah, who's who that in? One of the personalities that you haven't mentioned as far as family, you, you mentioned four different types of four. Where, yeah, types. Yeah. Where does the peacemaker ah. Well, the peacemaker would be most likely to be the phlegmatic personality. The easygoing, loving, kind, general uh, person, you know, who gets along with everybody. It probably fit in that category more than anybody. But sometimes it can be anybody. Uh, you know, it can be the, uh, uh, the sanguine personality who gets along with everybody easy at first, and then sometimes 
leaves before the task is completed. Okay, uh, it could be um, you know anybody could fill in that role, but that's the ones I would see most likely to be in that role. Okay. Again, that that role a lot of times is as Christians. Is God's talking to us. It's just tougher in some people than it is others to be in that role. Yeah. Okay. About out of time. Boy, you guys have been really good to listen tonight. I, I really do appreciate that. And I, I don't know why. I just felt like God told me that. To, I felt like that last week when we were talking about, talking about all the Calvinism versus Arminianism, which I thought was really uh, interesting to me. And this one just came out of this about listening to God and, being, and, and that relationship with God and how important that is. So... John's given me freedom to be able to teach what I wanted to, so I appreciate that too. So, okay, next week though we will get on the young earth. I guarantee you, the if you if you haven't seen some of this stuff, you're going to be mad at your science teachers. You have to say, okay. Anything else before we say good night? No Uh Kenny Duck, please some prayer. Dismiss us in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this study tonight, Lord. Bring it to us, Lord, and Lord, we just love you and praise you, and we we thank you for everything you do for us, Lord, and Lord, give us a safe trip home, and uh, watch over us and guide us, and Lord, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. 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 Thanks again for coming tonight. You'll appreciate it. Appreciate it.